jumping to a topic quickly, which is mental health. So I saw a couple of your of your videos. Uh, one of them was about perspective. I really like that, wherein you talked about eight critical points that makes us feel healthy and alive during this quarantine period, during this gloomy period. So would you shed more light on that? Yes, yeah, so what happens very often when someone gets into a difficult situation or faces a challenge, very often our vision narrows onto the problem and then the problem becomes all-encompassing in our lives. And it's, it's not dissimilar to an athlete, for example, who gets injured at the peak of their career, a sudden injury and maybe a life-threatening injury. Sorry, not a life-threatening, a career-threatening injury. And they just focus on the problem and injury and they can't necessarily see a way out of it and a way beyond it. Um, so what's useful in that situation is to be able to really step back and take a big picture view of our lives. Um, and one of the ways to do that is, you know, I suggest dividing a life into eight important areas and then actually look at each one of those individually, which gives us, enables us to see the broad perspective of our lives. So there's, you know, things like obviously the physical aspect, we need to be attending to that. We need to be eating healthily. Um, whatever we're drinking needs to be healthy. Uh, and we need to be getting whatever exercise we're able to given our unique situation. So the physical side, we need to make sure we're ticking a whole lot of boxes and moving ourselves forward. On the mental side, it's for, for a lot of people, particularly people who have been, whose careers and maybe whose companies have been largely disrupted by this, there will be a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress, um, and we need to make sure that, that we manage ourselves mentally very well, particularly mentally well through this, this situation. And again, I like it to liken it to an athlete who has an injury. They go through a range of emotions over that period of time. Well, it's not dissimilar to someone who has a, you know, a, a life changing incident, maybe a death in the family. We go through a, a cycle of emotions that is relatively predictable it's, um, and as long as we know what's coming and we know how to manage ourselves through it, uh, emotionally, we need to cater for ourselves, you know, and understand we need to keep ourselves in a good emotional space. Um, financially, a lot of people, there's significant financial ramifications of the, of the various lockdowns in various countries. So we need to make, instead of just sitting at home worrying about finances, we need to make sure we've got a plan. Uh, that plan needs to be well informed. We need to get good advice and we need to be taking action as opposed to just sitting and worrying. Uh, so there's a number of aspects of our lives when it comes to learning. It's a great time to go and learn something really interesting or useful um, in our lives because we do have now the time to do that uh, from a hobby perspective, you know, to make sure that we're doing something to be productive, uh, be pre fully present, so whatever it's uh, spiritually, you know, whatever our, someone's spiritual orientation is, it's just really important to, to be diligent around spiritual practices on a daily basis, which will help, all these things will help us navigate the situation smoothly. So yeah, perfect. So in another video, you talked about weathering the storms. So uh, this quarantine period, this often leads to uh, a fact, factors of stress and anxiety and depression wherein we start expecting things and that those don't happen and then we lead to such situations. So how can we curb that? So, I mean, you've, what's important is to, I think in this kind of, is to understand uh, and be prepared for things like anxiety is very normal. Um, being fearful, there are some people who are fearful. Um, and if we spend too much time being fearful, we really will be not doing ourselves, our bodies, we'll be doing ourselves a lot of harm if we remain in a fearful state for too long. And very often things like fear and depression, anxiety, actually just having an awareness of the fact that very often we do that to ourselves. And if we do it to ourselves for too long, we will think ourselves into a depressed state. So awareness is just so important. And that's really what I to wanted to put that information out there was so that people could see, for example, with fear that we, we create fear for ourselves by being present where we are now. And our mind is thinking about the future and thinking about all the things that might go wrong. And that creates fear. Um, it's when our mind gets stuck in the, in the future. And if we do that too much, you know, depression is something that 
it's, it's a heavy subject, um, but it's a very real possibility that a number of people who are what would be classified as healthy, normal people might actually find themselves moving towards a depressed state. Again, very similar. When an athlete has an injury that keeps them out of the game for a, a longish period of time, let's say something like six months, the majority of them at some point in the middle of that experience will find themselves in a, in a fairly depressed state. They think themselves into that depressed state. And if we get stuck in it's a normal and that's okay. But if we get stuck in it for too long, it certainly can become a problem for us and a, peop, a problem for people around. And at the moment, there really is a real um, possibility that people who've gone into this in a very, with a very healthy, normal, healthy mental state, if they spend too much time, number one, thinking about themselves, and number two, thinking about the problems that they're facing in their own lives, and if they keep thinking about me, my problems, me, my problems, me, my problems, eventually they will actually think themselves into a clinically depressed state. Um, and, you know, the severe forms of that, obviously there's tragic consequences of people who spend time in a severely depressed state. Um, and, you know, as I said, it's a heavy subject, but realistically we really do need to be aware of that and aware of people who potentially are at risk of, becoming depressed you know it's largely people who are living by themselves for example people who've really taken a severe knock in terms of their career or their business or their career earnings um and people who are naturally more pessimistic in their in their orientation uh those people are fairly high risk at the stage and we need they need to be aware of the risks and other people need to be aware of supporting them so they don't spend too much time stuck in that depressive cycle so talking about sports and cricket particularly, we have seen a number of examples like uh, England's Jonathan Trott, who was just completely jeopardized with his uh, depression and anxiety and it ultimately led to his, he left cricket. Now we saw an example of Glenn Maxwell. He opened about, about, about him and he took a break from cricket. So how do you yes. think it's important to take such breaks in such intervals in sports and cricket? It's, it's not so important to take breaks. Uh, what's important is to be able to have a mechanism in place where we're able to recognize um, players and athletes who are getting into that depressed state, that anxious state, that mentally unstable state. We need to recognize it earlier. We need to have... Um, there needs to be more awareness. It needs to, and we need to have the support bases um, in place. Where at the moment, unfortunately, particularly with male athletes, they, there's a real fear of them admitting to to a weakness, to a vulnerability, to a problem, particularly a mental problem, because they feel they're going to be judged as mentally weak or mentally fragile. So, particularly in the male sports, the problem is not so much the mental problems and the anxieties and depressions that happen. The problem is that there isn't a place for that to be acknowledged, spoken about and supported. It's really swept under the carpet. So that's the problem we, we need to, and certainly with what's happened more recently, quite a number of athletes, um, I think Moises Enriques, Maxwell, yeah. there's become more of a realization that this kind of stuff happens. You know, I know a study was recently done in professional rugby with all professional rugby players in South Africa. And 100% of players admitted to suffering from anxiety. Um, I think 40% of all professional rugby players had one or more, um, one more symptom of a, some mental illness. And in fact, 13% of them admitted to depression. So it is quite prevalent in professional sport, but it's something that's still not really spoken about and is judged quite negatively. So that's the problem. Well, so you have uh, followed uh, critically Virat Kohli's journey from being fat to fit. How do you analyze that from both mental and physical aspects? Um, you know, I haven't spoken to him directly. His, his, I worked with him when he was sort of early on in his career. Mm -hmm. um, and I wouldn't, wouldn't say he was fat, but he certainly wasn't anywhere near the condition he's in at the moment. And mm -hmm. It was only after that I, I was working personally with him with the Indian team that he underwent that, that change uh, in mindset and change in the way he trained, which brought about the change in his physicality and really just 
then physically supported um, him to be able to practice as hard as he practiced, bat for as long as, as long as he bats, and to keep staying mentally and physically fresh to repeatedly put in the performances he's being he's putting in. So he really does need to be to be operating in that really sharp end of the pencil at the highest, you know, the peak of the game of cricket. You need to have everything. Uh, and like we spoke about, you know, a little bit earlier, all the facets of your life really have to be working really, really well um, to be supporting, staying, delivering that amount of, um, under that amount of pressure that consistently. So that's really just supported. It's, it's a Dougie's foundation stronger and deeper by being as physically fit as he is. So uh, you've worked a lot with the Indian team and particularly in subcontinent continent conditions. So, what difference do you see in the two uh, fitness cultures as compared to 2011 or the previous decade and now? Well, when, when I joined the Indian team in 2008, the team already had two of probably two of the best fitness trainers in the world working with them since 2001. And the team that I met in 2008, after having very, very good fitness trainers, uh, was not a very fit team by any international sporting standards. Um, and, well, I mean, fitness in itself was only really adopted as a norm in international cricket in the early 2000s. Um, and some of the subcontinent teams were a little bit later to really pick up fitness as a priority. Um, and that certainly has changed since the 2008 to 2011 that I was with the team. Fitness is, you see a lot more players being a lot fitter. There seems to be much more of a fitness culture with a new and younger breed of cricketers than what there was with the cricketers, you know, that had already established themselves in the early 2000s. The, you know, the Laxmans, Tendulkas, uh, Dravids, Gangulis, Anil Kumble they were all already established and playing international cricket at the time that fitness started becoming something was important. When they started out in their careers in international cricket, fitness wasn't really a thing. It wasn't a strong consideration in international cricket. Uh, but now the youngsters who are coming through now, they're coming into uh, international cricket with a realization that we really do need to have ourselves. And the amount of cricket now is far more than what it was 15 years ago. So even for that reason, it's that much more important for a player to be fit, to be able to actually perform 12 months of the year without getting injured. So any fond memories from the terrific World Cup campaign in 2011? Oh, all of them. <laughs> Everything about it was fond memories. It was, um, yeah, it was just one of those things that we prepared excellently for it. We had a great team. We had a great team culture a great work ethic. Um, we we're playing really good crickets. There was players were really supporting each other. So it was very much of a team um, support your mates. Uh, if they're doing well, if they're not doing well, also support your mates. So it was a really special team <coughs> that we had built over the three years. Um, it was a very special team culture. There was a lot of very special cricketers in the team and they were playing really, really good cricket. So Everything we did in the lead up to that 2011 World Cup was aimed at winning it. And I've always said, if you win, if you're, if you're part of a, a sports team, winning shouldn't be a surprise. That's, if you win, it should be, well, that's exactly what we planned for. And it's, it's almost, a, it's, it's meeting an expectation or a relief in a way. So it was just amazing that all our plans were so carefully and smartly laid that they all came together. So... But the, the moment when Dhoni hit the, that match winning six, um, yeah, it was without a doubt the single highest moment of my entire life. Terrific. So time and again, you have praised uh, Rahul Dravid for his discipline and his fitness culture and his mental toughness. So how do you see him as compared to the other cricketers or former cricketers? I don't, well, I don't compare him. You know, it's just, I, I think I'll say so What that makes him special? Let me put it that way. Well, again, you know, I was, I've been lucky to work with him when I, when I was with the Indian team for three years, so when he was a player. And then post that at Rajasthan Royals, he was the, coach, the captain. I was a coach for two years and then I was the coach and I stayed as coach and he came on as a team mentor. So I've had probably seven, eight years of working very closely with him. So I've got to know him a lot better than, than a lot of the other players. 
But what I really appreciated is, is his character. I mean, there's a lot of great cricketers out there. Um, he's got a great mind, but it's who he is as a human being. And I've, I've always said that, I've said this repeatedly, that I'm not impressed by a fantastic athlete and I don't have heroes in cricket or any sport. What impresses me is really good people. Um, and if somebody is a, is a really successful individual in their career and they happen to be a really good human being, that impresses me. Um, and Rahul is definitely one of those people. It's, you know, it's who he is as a human being that is most impressive. And I admire and appreciate and respect that um, a lot more actually than his cricketing prowess because the cricketing prowess, he was born with that. You know, it was a talent he was born with and he did, he worked, he had an amazing work ethic. So he was able to make the most out of his talent. But talent is something we're born with. It's, it's not an achievement. And that's why I say I, I'm not impressed by people with a great talent because it's just a gift that they were born with. But being a really good person of sound character and a, and a high quality human being, we're all born with the ability to, to bring that out in ourselves. And when somebody really does a great job in being a great person, for me, that's more of an achievement and more of something that I, I hold in high regard than someone who's lucky to be born with great talent. So, uh, Paddy, what's your idea of imbibing something into a youngster when he comes to you, firstly? In general, general walk of life or something about sports? Just ask that question again. So what's your idea of imbibing something into a youngster, some good aspects, positive aspects, when someone, some young dad comes to you, lad comes to you? So, so, I mean, one of the early things I would do, just sort of thinking off the top of my head is, you know, they would probably come to me initially because they have some aspiration in a, in a sport or in a professional pursuit. And we'll look at, so what do they want to accomplish? Where do they want to get to? What do they need to do in order to get there? But that's the professional side. Then I will at the same time look at, okay, so who, as a human being, who do you want at some point later in your life? How do you want to be known? What do you want to be recognized for? What do you want your teammates to say about you? Uh, what do you want your coaches to say about you? What do you want your fans to think about you? What do you want your friends and your parents to think about you? And I get people to really be uh, intentional about the kind of person that they want to become at the same time being intentional with the, the kind of athletes that they want to become. And they need to go on both of those journeys, not just on the journey of scoring as many runs as they can, um, but also a journey of being, being the best human being that they could be. Uh, and then, because the thing is everyone's, every cricket career will end, you know, generally be well before 40 years old. There's not many Praveen Tambays out there. Um, and even a business career will end at some point and people will continue in their lives way beyond when they finish playing their sport, God willing. Um, so who we are as a person actually endures a lot longer than what we do as a profession. So that's why it's, it's very important that a player also sets themselves up for post their playing days which a young player coming to the beginning of their career, they don't even think about, they, they don't have a concept of at some point, I'm actually going to either maybe not make it, or even if I do make it, I'm going to move on and actually have a longer life outside of playing professional cricket than I'll have inside it. But many young players don't see that. So what advice do you actually give them for not succumbing to the pressure of constantly playing and just playing on the field? I don't give them any advice. I just give them, I get them to realize the full extent of life. And life isn't okay. just being a cricketer. Right. And when they understand the full extent, then I get them to make decisions about other areas of their life, not just okay. cricket. So do you think, are there any other issues to be resolved for the mental and health, mental and physical aspects as com for the international cricket or sports? Um, do players still need to evolve I, I, I as think far what, as the men mental aspect is concerned? You know, what we need to do is just keep speaking to players. You know, it's, 
I would be guessing what their needs are. And I've had some insight into obviously Indian cricket and South African cricket and the T20 tournaments, but I, I haven't seen the full landscape of what is required in international cricket. And, and the, this, the very simple answer is what we need to do is we need to constantly be speaking to players and to administrators and to coaches and find out how can we improve cricket as an overall product. And it's, and as long as we're asking those questions, how can we be on a journey of continuous improvement in all aspects of the game, then we'll find out what is needed and we attend to that. But the problem is not asking those questions. And it's no different to any business. You know, if you, businesses are changing, everything's changing. And if you're well informed, you can make adjustments to keep your business relevant. But if you're not well informed and you're not asking questions from all around you, there's a chance that you become irrelevant or someone overtakes you. Um, so, you know, we're living in a time we need to constantly learn. And the way to learn is to constantly be gathering information. So we, so we're well informed in our decisions and we'll just cricket needs to make sure that they remain being well informed um, at state levels at, at within countries and within the global game, because there's a number of other sports that are doing very good jobs and attracting more and more, uh, sponsors more and more fans. There's some sports that are growing and there's some sports that around the world that are falling back because they're not reinventing and they're not staying up with modern times. And cricket just needs to make sure that it's constantly innovating for good and not just resting on their laurels um, and thinking that everything's okay because so, times change. All right. So to conclude, do you want, would you like to give any final word of advice to our viewers watching right now? Um, yeah, I to think cope up with the pressure during these. You know, days. Everyone is going through their own unique situation at the moment, so there isn't one piece of advice that works for everybody. But I think the the real important thing is we need to be supporting each other. Um, we're at our homes now. A lot of people are isolated, and it's actually a time where we need to be working together, connecting with people. Um, in whatever ways we can and not just thinking about ourselves and our own survival. We need to be working as a, as a larger community um, within areas in India, within states need to be working together, the whole of the Indian population. And globally, this is really is a time where we need to be well informed, manage ourselves well, make really good decisions and work well together to create the kind of world that we're going to emerge into after this. It's not going to happen by itself. It's going to take people like you and me and our friends to create the kind of world that is awaiting to emerge from this. Uh, it's up to us. Okay, so that sums it all, I guess. So all the best for future. Have a great day and stay safe. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, you. Bye -bye. thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.